Okay, so it has been a long time since we have had a lecture video. I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as possible, mostly because I have about 10 minutes before class is coming in, so we're going to see how this goes. So forensic serology, we're talking about blood. The main thing that I want you to get from this is that this is just kind of a uh, condensation of uh, condensing, I guess, of all of the uh, the stuff that you researched. We probably won't hit all of it, but what you need to know is you need to know this for the quiz. You also are ultimately going to need to know this stuff for the final. Uh, and so I'm going to try to correct some of the stuff that I saw uh, for the presentations and also a few things that I said that was maybe incorrect as well that I didn't realize at the time. Okay, so composition of blood. We're not going to necessarily work on percentages here, but it's a mixture. It's not as like a, it's not its own Product blood isn't a thing. It's a combination of cells, enzymes, proteins, and um, inorganic substances like iron and magnesium, like things that um, oxygen, stuff like that. Um, it mainly consists of erythrocytes, which are red blood cells. Red blood cells are like the carriers. They bring oxygen. They bring nutrients throughout your body. Um, you need to be able to tell the difference between red blood cells and white blood cells. Leukocytes are the white blood cells. They deal a lot with our immune system, among other things. Um, platelets are the clotting factors. If you cut yourself, then the blood kind of dries up on your hand. Um, that's the platelets causing it to clot. If you didn't have that, you would get a paper cut, bleed to death. Um, plasma is the actual liquid part. So that's what I'm saying. Blood is not just a, a particular substance itself. Uh, it's not red and liquidy. What you're seeing there is actually the plasma. So we're going to try to understand the, the how uh, antigens and antibodies work. Antigens are proteins on the surface of red blood cells. Red blood cells, think of a donut with the middle filled in just a little bit. It's concave on, on both sides. And so you've got this little disc here. Okay, and antigens are proteins that are located on the surface of that disc. Okay, antibodies, if an antibody uh, comes in contact, it, it will bind with that antigen. There's a specific antibody for every antigen that if it reacts, it will form clumps, which is no good. Okay, it works good for blood typing, but it's not good in real life. And that is called agglutination. Okay, it's similar to, like, if you, uh, if you took a raw steak and you threw it on a hot griddle, those proteins bind together. Okay, it's, it's a form of that. That's actually coagulation, but it's the same type of thing of, uh, of antigens and antibodies clumping together. So, we're going to try to understand the ABO system real quick. If you have blood type A, then you have the A antigen on your uh, on the actual cell itself. But the serum, okay, which is another component of your blood, contains an anti-B serum. Okay? So that anti-B, it's just fine to be with the A with the A antigen. If you have blood type B, okay, then you have the B antigen and you have the anti-A serum. Okay? Everything's good. There's no agglutination taking place. If you have AB blood, then that means you have both proteins on your red blood cells, and that you have neither antigen in your serum. Okay, or excuse me, you have neither neither the A or B antibody. Try to keep these terms straight. If you have type O blood, then you do not have an A or B protein, and you also you have both the anti A and the anti B antibody in your serum. Okay, so if the way we do blood typing is when you when you mix these bloods, you see if they agglutinate, and then you can determine what type of blood it is. So type A agglutinates with anti-A. So if you took a type B blood and put it with type A, it would agglutinate. Okay? Same thing with B. You took B and you added it to A, it would agglutinate. AB would agglutinate with both anti-A and anti-B, and O will not agglutinate with any serum, okay, because it doesn't contain those antigens. Now, the question that we get is we talk, sometimes we call O the universal donor, okay, which is kind of true, but what they're actually, what they, what they do nowadays a lot of times is because if you see type O blood has both the anti-A and anti-B um, antibodies, and so shouldn't it clump up and agglutinate with all the other ones? It can, okay? So a lot of times that when blood is taken, they actually kind of remove the blood, red blood cells and the, and the platelets and the plasma, and they, they kind of separate them out, okay? So whenever you're adding that O, you're adding the red blood cells themselves, um, then you're, you're not actually adding in that, that serum. So that you're not getting, because it wouldn't necessarily be good along the way. Um, now, so same thing here. Let's look at our, our blood toners here. And so, our blood donors. Um, blood type A can donate to A or AB. 
Okay, it can receive from A or O. Same thing with B. It can give to B or AB, and it receives from either B or O. You're going to need to know this, by the way, this chart. If you have AB blood, you can only donate to other AB bloods. Okay, uh, but you can receive from anything. Okay, because so remember we go back to this, and and it has neither the A anti A or anti B. Um, serum so it can receive any type of blood. Um, and then blood type O, you can donate to anyone, okay, but you can only receive from other O's. So AB is called the universal recipient. These are not really good terms anymore. Type O, which is the most common among humans. I said something in, in like one or two of the classes that type O was not the most common blood. I was thinking of A positive. A positive is the second most common, and I was thinking of O negative. O negative is the least common. O positive is the most common. Uh, so I said that wrong in a couple of classes. I wanted to fix that. Um, type O, especially O positive, is the most um, the most common blood type. Okay, Rh factor. Um, this is the rhesus factor, and it's very important. Um, it's another type of antigen. Okay, remember those proteins there on the blood cells. It's a it's another uh, important antigen. Some people carry it, some do not, and sometimes it's called the D antigen, like A, B, or whatever. If you have the D antigen, then you are Rh positive. So if somebody says that you have O positive blood type, that means you have the O is your type, okay, and you have the the Rh positive. Uh, you you're positive. You have the Rh positive. It's O positive. Um, this is important when it comes to compatibility with donors. Um, if you are Rh positive, you can receive any type, either positive or negative blood, but an Rh negative person can only receive from another Rh negative because it will agglutinate, okay? And so you have to, to factor that in as well. Genetics of blood, we got the Punnett squares here. You, you should know how to do this. A and B are both dominant. O is, is recessive. Uh, and so you can see the different combinations there. I'll probably ask you to do a Punnett square if I gave you a, you know, a, a person who has AB blood and a person who, who has um, O blood, you know, to tell me what their allele combinations would be. And so, I mean, that works pretty well. What type of the possible blood types with an AB female and a type O male? You would have either type A or type B because um, that A and B is going to be dominant no matter what and that O is going to be recessive. Okay, forensics of blood. There's three questions that we need to answer. One, is it blood? Is it human or animal blood? And whose blood is it? First one, is it blood? There's two different tests. There's the Kasselmeyer test. Um, this will turn blood bright pink, and it's used for visible stains that you can actually see. You can, you know, you see something, you determine if it is blood. Um, luminol. Um, luminol glows a, flore a fluorescent blue when you spray on something. This is something used for invisible stains. Blood that has been cleaned up, blood that has been, even if it's years past, okay, you use luminol to see how the, to, to determine whether or not that blood was there. Uh, precipitin test. This is the second question, is it human or animal blood? You take human blood and you can inject it into an animal. Usually this is going to be a rabbit. And what happens is that the antibodies will then neutralize and it will make an, a human antiserum. Um, the quet, then you take that the blood and you put it together in a little glass tube called a capillary tube. And then if there is a band form at the surface of it, then it will tell you whether or not it is a if it is either the same type of blood or if it is different. Okay, I have to rush because I have kids about to beat in the door. Um, okay, and then the last thing is who blood is it? You would use a, whose blood is it? You would use a DNA analysis uh, to figure that out. Okay. Now, when we're talking about characterizing blood evidence, the class characteristics are those questions we ask. What species does it belong to? What blood type is it? What is the Rh factor? Um, is there any diseases present? Those are class characteristics. Individual characteristics are coming down on, on DNA. If you just find blood, it doesn't tell you whose it is until you do a DNA analysis of it. Blood stain patterns, important. I mean, we've covered this, but we'll go through it real quick. Um, appearance, distribution, and location are three important factors. You need to know the difference between passive, which is like dripping stains, okay, either from gravity or from just like just falling elsewhere, passive stains. Transfer would be like uh, a shoe print, a hand print, uh, rubbing up against something, that transfer stain, and a projected stain is actual blood from impact um, that hits the wall or hits uh, a surface. Surface texture changes the appearance of the drop. Um, direction of travel, uh, like the way that it points, 
it faces the direction of the travel. Uh, we've already talked about angle of impact before, but you take the width divided by the length, then you get the arc sign, and then you can track that back. Um, and the way that it works is you draw lines from several blood stains, and where they intersect, this is called the area of convergence. You need to know that. Um, body fluids. Let's go through this real quick. Saliva. This consists of water. Mucin. This helps you to swallow. Analase, which is a type of, um, of uh, enzyme. Uh, use in digestion, that's why it starts to break down food, food, and then buccal cells, these are your cheek cells, okay? This is great for if you find saliva that you can actually generally pull DNA from it because of those cells. Um, um, you're going to find saliva especially when you're dealing with sexual assaults or bite marks, um, and this is how you test for it. You take a mixture of starch, iodine, and the saliva. The starch will turn blue when you add the iodine to it, but then that amylase will break down the starch, and if it starts to fade the color, then that's saliva. Semen. This consists of water, spermatozoa, enzymes, and organic salts. Okay? The way a presumptive test is it will fluoresce under UV light. Um, there's also the acid phosphatase in it that causes it to, to turn purple. Uh, there's a, another test that you can do. Uh, confirmatory test, you do the... Um, Microscopic examination to determine if you see the spermatozoa in there, um, and then um, DNA typing as well. Then finally, urine. Um, this is definitely used to determine if there's drugs found in the body. There's the emit test. Uh, we're not going to go into the details of it, um, but that can help you to determine whether or not there's very specific drugs in there, and that's what I want you to know. The end.